uh, using these modes, we can view the properties of spatially shaped quantum noise. Okay, so these were the first uh, ideas. So in this talk, we 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 now uh, are going to to uh, to comment about the sources of quantum light or the sources of quantum squeezed light, and uh, and then the, the relation how these these sources, the parametric amplification or an oscillation, uh, generate the squeezed and entangled light. Okay, in the process of parametric down conversion. Then I will switch to the detection of these structured light beams, okay, quantum structured light beams. So it's a spatially resolved uh, uh, homodyne detection. And then I will uh, briefly uh, uh, describe, well, not so briefly actually, <laughs> because I, I, I wrote some, you know, this uh, in a bit of detail, but uh, I, I will describe this application, uh, an application of uh, spatially structured light uh, with reduced quantum noise to a metrology problem. Okay, that may be, maybe it can be useful for you in your experiments. Okay, and draw my conclusions. So, uh, the optical parametric oscillator. So, as I mentioned uh, already in the, in, the, in the quantum breakfast, okay, I will just briefly uh, review what we, we saw there, okay? Essentially, uh, a parametric oscillator is a, a, a normal harmonic oscillator in which you uh, modulate with time some parameter of your oscillator. So the most common uh, daily life example is a child in the swing, okay? So the child in the swing knows that uh, 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 she can amplify or de-amplify the, the oscillation, her oscillation in the swing, by modulating the uh, uh, momentum of inertia. Okay, uh, if it, if it's like in this way, like a, a steady, so she would like low, uh, lower and raise periodically. Okay, if it's seated, we know that we can like uh, uh, how can I say stretch the legs. Okay, or fold the legs. Okay, and we have to do this with the right uh, frequency and with the right phase. So what happens is that uh, by doing this with the right frequency, so usually you see that in a half oscillation of the pendulum, the child has to lower and raise. So the, a modula the modulation must do a full cycle in half cycle of the oscillator. So we see already a, a factor two in the frequency, okay? So the frequency of the modulation is twice the frequency of the oscillation. Moreover, if the child lowers at the, at the, at the extreme of the movement and, uh, and raise at, at the lowest point here, okay, which would be the, 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 the can I say, a five phase shift, or I don't know, two, depending on, on what uh, relationship we're using, okay. But uh, actually, what happens is that instead of amplifying, you will de-amplify the movement. So the main idea of a parametric oscillator is that it is a phase-sensitive amplifier. So you have some device, okay, some oscillator, you are going to uh, modulate some parameter of the oscillator, and this modulation will allow you to transfer or to remove energy from the oscillator depending on the, on the, uh, on, on both, on the frequency and on the phase of the, of the modulation. Okay, so it's a phase sensitive amplifier. And this is the key ingredient for understanding why a parametric oscillator squeeze light. Okay, it's a key ingredient, it's a very important. So uh, how can we transport this, uh, this idea to the optical domain? So essentially, we, uh, uh, the optical uh, parametric amplification uh, occurs in the in the nonlinear response of an optical medium. So uh, you take a, a, a dielectric medium, okay? You write the the polarization, the electric polarization of the medium. Here is the the linear term that we usually uh, deal with that gives rise to index of refraction and, and to basic properties of, uh, of the materials. So then we, we we can go to the second order, third order, but let's focus here on the second order, okay? So the, the second order is uh, is a quadratic term in the in the 
in the, in the applied electric field. Uh, of course, it cannot happen in a symmetric, in a, a simple symmetric, for example, medium, because uh, as you invert the, 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 the direction of the, invert the, the sense of the oscillation of the, of the electric field, you see that it does not, uh, the polarization will not follow the same, uh, the same symmetry. So it cannot be realized in a central symmetric uh, medium, okay? But let's suppose we have some anisotropic medium that capable to give us this kind of uh, second order response. And uh, if we write this, this, uh, this second order term together with the first order in this manner here, so we can think like, uh, of, of this nonlinear process as if the electric field, the oscillating electric field was modulating the index of refraction of the medium, okay? It's, it's, all, uh, also, uh, it's modulating the index, uh, its own index of refraction inside the medium, okay? So in this sense, this is called a parametric process in optics, okay? Because you have some also a parameter that is oscillating there as it demodulated, which is the refractive index. And of course, it gives you the, the, the possibility to uh, uh, exchange, uh, uh, how can I say, create an energy exchange between different colors of the, of the spectrum. Okay? So uh, we have uh, both up conversion and down conversion in this. So if we use the, the complex notation for the electric field. So we will see that by combining the two parts, the, the, the this positive frequency part and negative frequency part, we give rise both to frequency addition and subtraction. We can give rise to, to both. So our, actually we will focus our attention in the down conversion process, which is the one that uh, actually combines in here, for example, the positive frequency with the negative frequency. Okay, so it's the frequency difference generation. So actually what happens is that uh, we pump a nonlinear crystal with some uh, uh, laser frequency on the P and, uh, the, and you can generate pairs of beams, uh, beams omega signal and linear, okay? Actually this process, uh, uh, <coughs> If, uh, actually, this process included by, uh, by the quantum vacuum, by the vacuum fluctuations. And from this process, you can generate pairs of photons or more intense beams, depending on your, your condition. Okay? So uh, we have two kinds of, uh, we can see essentially uh, two different kinds of process, the degenerate process in which uh, a photon of, uh, of the pump beam is uh, destroyed and a pair of photons is created in a single mode, okay, or in a single down converted mode. So this is the this is the generate case, okay? So you, you generate, you, you annihilate one, let's say <coughs> a violet photon, and you create a pair of infrared photons that are completely indistinguishable. So they propagate along the same direction with the same polarization and with the same frequency. Okay, so this is the degenerate phase. Okay, the non degenerate phase is when you can somehow distinguish the photons with some degree of freedom. It could be the direction of emission, the longitudinal mode, it could be the polarization for type 2 phase match, for example, or it could be orbital or momentum. Okay, uh, they could have different orientation, uh, for example. So this is the non degenerate phase. Okay, now. Uh, all this is a parametric amplification. Right? What about oscillation? Oscillation, of course, when you place this nonlinear crystal inside a cavity. So with the cavity feedback, what happens is that this process of uh, spontaneous parametric emission, it is, uh, how can I say, feedback, this, this feedback, and then uh, it's amplified inside the cavity, it becomes an oscillator. In this, in this situation, it becomes an oscillator. So here is the case of the, the how can I say, the, the intracavity degenerate phase, okay? So you have pairs of photons being created and they keep bouncing back and forth inside the cavity, uh, uh, feeding back the, the process, okay? And then you generate uh, some output being here. What happens is that under this condition, okay, this kind of, uh, of device 
has, uh, as a consequence of its nonlinear dynamics, it has a, a threshold. So as you raise the pump power, at some point, okay, you, at some point, you start to have, uh, actually, you start to have intense beams being, uh, an intense beam being generated by the, by the device. So essentially, what happens is that when you, you, you write down the equations for the, the uh, uh, method of simulation, uh, what you find is that uh, you, you have always a, st uh, a steady state uh, solution, uh, which is essentially the, the pump beam seeing an empty cavity and no, uh, no uh, how can I say, down converted photons being generated, no down converted energy being generated, okay? But then, uh, as you reach a, a certain pump level, which is called the pressure, you start to have a second possible solution, which is a solution in, uh, in which you have uh, down conversion power uh, production, okay? So you have uh, power being productive uh, product in the down conversion. What happens is that actually you have two steady state solutions, but this one, the non-operating one becomes unstable above threshold, okay? So this means that the device can be triggered by any noise. If we are talking about classical, uh, classical description, we would need to suppose that some trigger pulse or some trigger beam uh, was sent into the into the cap. Okay. However, uh, we know that we don't need that, and this is because vacuum fluctuations. So vacuum fluctuations work as the the seed noise to start the, the process. It's just exactly like the laser. The laser has the same. So the same. Bigger, the, the X coordinate is the pump power. Yes, this is the pump power the normalized y. by the threshold. Okay, so this is one is right on uh, the threshold. And this is the down converted power. So this is it's the, yes, I, I'm sorry. This is the down converted power as a function of the pump, uh, of the pump, pump power. Okay, okay so. So from zero to one, there's no pump. No, there's no, no there is no down conversion. Okay. Actually, what we see is just fluorescence. We see we see light. And this is this is just the classical behavior. We are not th there is no spontaneous emission in this figure here. Okay. So actually, when people operate the overload below threshold to generate this light, they are operating below uh, they are operating with the uh, or can I say amplified spontaneous emission? It's a bit different from this, okay? There is something like a, a phase transition that occurs here, okay? So, for example, below threshold, there is no uh, the, the, the phase and the line width of the down converter. Mm -hmm. The phase of the, the down converter B is, is random and its line width is very wide, okay? As you, you cross the, the threshold, the line width becomes narrow. It's, it's exactly like the shallow towns effect for the laser, but it also occurs in the OPO. Okay? So it becomes a coherent beam, a coherent beam, okay? and, uh, and uh, with a well defined phase. So there is a phase transition at the, at the threshold. Okay. Yeah. So, so we are just thinking of So if, if in, in in our down conversion experiments, you have some power. No? You, are, you are emitting photons. Yeah. Is this below threshold or? Well, you know, a down conversion, you, have, you don't have a cavity. So it's pointless it's because it's like the, the, the threshold is infinite. Okay. You are below threshold. Yes. We are below threshold. But you are still, we are still emitting photons. Yes. So it's spontaneous emission. Oh, okay. So you mean that this is it's spontaneous emission. It's, it's you, you see, this is not included in the model here. So it's just a, a completely classical model. How is it? Okay. It's a completely classical model. So there's no it's spontaneous emission is not, is not there. And the unstable solution, how is it goes? Because I, I don't see it's zero. Oh, it's zero. The stable solution is really zero, it doesn't go anywhere. The unstable is zero. Yeah. So classically, you should see no light, no down converted light. Okay. Classically, you should see no down converted light. You see, because of the quantum vacuum, that light. Triggers the process. Okay. Uh, then, so uh, below threshold, what we have is amplified vacuum. And this is why people call it squeezed vacuum. Mm -hmm. Squeezed vacuum. But the input is, is vacuum. 
Now, uh, oh, okay, and then uh, below, to, however, below traction, you have a squeeze light. And this squeeze light, uh, you know, you, you measure it, uh, how can you characterize it? Uh, through the quadrature fluctuation. So the first talk, we, we talked about the quadrature. So here we see that the, the, the squeeze the skirt is a uh, minimally uncertain state, which has more uh, uh, fluctuations in one quadrature than on the other. And this is why we call it squeeze. So this is what we see, squeeze like below threshold. What happens above threshold? Above threshold, the squeezing is gone. Okay, the squeezing is gone. And essentially, the reason why the squeezing is gone is that is because below what, what, what happens is that below threshold in, in, in the in the pre space process, we always assume that the pump is non depleted. So the pump does not fuse. So it has so many photons. You only pick a, a, a few photons from the pump. So the state of the pump is practically unchanged. But when the, the when the OPO reaches the the, the threshold, then the pump starts to become really, really, really affected by the process. Okay, actually, you can show that as uh, I did not plot the, the power of the pump mode inside the cartridge, this green right here, for example. But actually, what happens here is that you, you raise linearly, and when you reach the power, it becomes flipped, it becomes constant, even in this model, even in this classical model. Okay, so this means that any extra power of the pump that you send to the cavity, it does not, uh, it will be completely transferred to the down converter. So the pump after the, the, the threshold, the pump power remains constant. Okay, so any extra power that you send will be, uh, will be sent, will be transferred to the down converter. So what happens here is that actually, uh, if you see it from the quantum perspective, you are starting to, to, to have a, a state, a quantum state that must be somehow entangled between the pump and the signal. And if you measure only the signal, so there is information that you will be thrown away because you are not seeing what happens to the pump. Okay? This has been proved, not for the not for the degenerate uh, OPO, but for the non-degenerate. Okay? So the non-degenerate OPO is about the same uh, idea. Now we will have the, the non-degenerate process uh, amplified inside the cavity. Again, you have a threshold, a stable solution, uh, so the, the, the trivial solution becomes unstable. The stable solution is actually a, a solution that predicts that you generate a pair of intense beams okay with some uh, coherent intensity okay that they, they, they interfere even with each, with each other and uh what happens is that actually uh, if you should describe it quantum mechanically is below threshold uh, actually what you are doing is the two mode squeezing so the two mode squeezing for signal line suppose that they have different colors or they could have different polarizations as i said or different OEMs. Okay, so the, fact, uh, the point is that we are generating a, a two mode squeezing, and this uh, means quadrature entanglement. Quadrature entanglement that can be measured by combining the two uh, quadratures of the two beams and uh, uh, defining the so called EPR variable. Okay, the, the kind of variable that we use for Einstein Podolsky rows and describe the Einstein Podolsky rows and parallels. Okay. And then in these EPR variables, you will see the squeezing, which is, a, which is interesting uh, that is that you can see uh, simultaneous squeezing in two uh, simultaneous, uh, in two different uh, variables. Okay? Because actually you have four possibilities. You can combine the two with a plus and a minus, and for each combination, you will have the X and Y quadrature. So you can have squeezing uh, simultaneously in both parameters here, and actually this can be uh, characterized by this this criteria. Okay. I thought that this this is for below threshold. So for below threshold. Uh, this is all. This all happens for below threshold. Again, what happens if you go uh, 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 above the threshold is that the pump the pump beam becomes clipped again. 
So the funding uh, becomes affected, and actually you start to have three partisan panels between top city and island, and this has been experimentally demonstrated, okay? This has been experimentally demonstrated in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. Oh, yeah. yeah, the people from Sao Paulo show that. So they, they independently measure the, the quadrature fluctuations for signal, for island, and for pop, okay? And they show that, that there were tripartite correlations between okay? uh, Yes, a both okay. okay, um now what about homodyne detection? Okay, so how we do homodyne detection with the structured uh, beam, spatially structured beam. So what happens is that now you, you can set your OPO to generate whatever mode you want. For example, like uh, in Maria, we are going to, to try to generate OAM beams, the squeeze OAM beams are right there. So the point is, uh, how can I characterize the, the, the noise in, in, in the, so first, the, the measurement setting for, for squeeze light is the homodyne detection. The idea is that you, you have some source, OPO or whatever source that generates squeeze light. Sometimes people also produce squeeze light with, uh, with the Chi 3 process, which is four way mixing, okay? It's, it's becoming very popular even for spectral light nowadays, okay? But then uh, you have some source that generates some squeeze light or some quantum noise with just B, uh, with just B. And then you send it to a, a, a normal beam splitter, okay? A, a, a half, half beam splitter where this beam is mixed with a, a, a coherent state from a local oscillator, okay, so from a, a laser beam. And this local oscillator uh, is essentially prepared with a coherent state. This coherent state has some uh, absolute value. It, it has the, the, the eigenvalue of alpha, which is a complex number. The absolute value of alpha I define here as R, and theta is the phase of the local oscillator, okay? Now, what happens is that when the two beams uh, are combined in the, in the beam splitter, the output, uh, the output beams are combinations of the input ones, and if we compute the, the, the noise or the intensity difference between the two detectors here, or the two outputs of the beam splitter, we see that actually in detecting the, two, the difference between two intensities, we are actually measuring this kind of uh, Combination of the few uh, variables from one B and the other, A dagger one, A two, plus A one, A dagger two. Okay, but since A one, which is the local oscillator, is prepared in a coherent state, this average, uh, this average here becomes just a combination of A two and A two dagger, with uh, uh, weighted by the coherent state eigenvalue alpha here. So actually, by this shows that by changing the phase of the local oscillator, we can measure arbitrary quadratures of the uh, of the signal B. Okay, so this is how we probe the, the, the our our sample B in phase space. So if the quadrature space is the phase space for the for the sample B, then by changing the phase of the local oscillator. I can scan different directions in the phase space. So I can go through the squeezed part and then to the anti-squeezed part and see the full uh, ellipse, my uh, noise ellipse, okay? Now, what about losses? What does losses do, okay, with uh, squeezing? So, it's very interesting that actually there is a very simple model to see what happens when the squeeze light passes through a lossy channel. Okay? And this model is again the beam splitter. Any lossy channel you can model as a beam splitter in which part of the beam is transmitted, part of the, of the beam is reflected uh, somewhere so to some place that you both access, okay, some information that you don't see. And actually, in, in, in this sense, the transmitted beam in, the, in this uh, beam, uh, the beam splitter model, of course, in the other, the any beam splitter has two 
two inputs, two output ports, two input ports, and two output ports. In the, in the other input port, you have vacuum type. So what happens is that the signal that you are going to measure is the original one, but now contaminated with vacuum fluctuations for this loss of channel. Okay, any any loss that you have in, in your in your system or your experimental apparatus, you can model this way. Okay, and then you can like this is a very simple model for the beam splitter relation input output the relation for the beam splitter. So what happens is that of uh, of course the the what we're measuring here, which is uh here I here is is okay it's, it's, it's supposed to be beam two because. This is the what the signal out and this is the loss. So this uh, should have collected this. But okay. Well, so now suppose that this is this is the signal. Okay? This is the signal that you are measuring. Okay, and actually, of course, the intensity that you are measuring is just the intensity, the original intensity, uh, multiplied by the transmission coefficient. It's okay. But what happens to the variance? Now the variance is attenuated with the square. With the square for the transmission. Okay, so now we know that, uh, as you as you and this this quantity here. Okay, for squeeze the line when, when you have a squeeze the squeeze uh, some some amount of intensity squeezing, for example. Actually, the, the, when we are detecting, we always detect intensity squeeze always. What we detect directly is always. The, uh, intensity squeezing from the beam that we are detecting. So in the homodyne detection scheme, what we do is that, okay, you, you have an original signal, you combine the local oscillator, and the combined beam has an intensity fluctuations that is proportional to the quadrant fluctuations of the your sample beam. But what you are measuring is the intensity fluctuations of the combined beam. So what happens is that if you have some amount of squeezing, for example, this quantity should be negative. And then this negative part will be, um, how can I say, attenuated with the square of the transmission. Okay, so this is why squeezing and quantum noise and quantum properties of uh, even a macroscopic beam is very sensitive to losses, okay? very sensitive to losses. Now, I will combine the two concepts here to describe the homodyne detection with some spatially structured beam. Okay, so this is why I, I talked about losses, homodyne detection, and losses because we will see that now we have to take care of the spatial properties of the sample beam and of the local oscillator in order to do a faithful characterization of the quantum noise uh, of the sample beam, okay? So now we suppose that our local oscillator has some spatial function U1, and our signal beam has some spatial function U2. And you repeat the calculations, okay? And uh, as uh, I mentioned uh, in, in the first talk, okay, what the detector sees is, a, is an integration of the, uh, of the intensity distribution, but now, we have different spatial profiles, so this integration will involve some some kind of overlap between the spatial the spatial uh, distribution of the local oscillator and the spatial distribution of the signal. Okay, so this will work as a kind of transmission. This will work as a kind of transmission. Okay, and what actually actually what we see over there is that the homodyne detection signal will be proportional to the transmission uh, or to this overlap, okay? And the fluctuations will also be attenuated by this overlap. This overlap can be, the maximum value that we have here is one. When we have the same spatial structure, then we, we use the normalization uh, of, of the spatial functions uh, to show that this is equal to one, okay? So then, uh, how can I say? Um, a, a, a misadapt, a mismatch, a mismatch spatial structure of the local oscillator will act as loss for your homodyne detection. And this includes everything. I cannot, for example, I cannot detect uh, an OAM, like a Gaussian mode, 
Here, we use a Gaussian mean. I will read this, we get zero. Zero, zero square. Kt will be equal to zero. Okay, so I will have just short noise here. Okay, even if I put two Gaussian beams, note that I must match their properties like waste, uh, wavefront, the position of the fo uh, focal position, everything must be matched. Okay, the wavefront must be perfectly matched. If I want to have maximum uh, sensitivity in the homotopic function. Otherwise, I will see just part of the of the, no, of the noise reduction that I want to see contaminated with some uh, vacuum noise. Okay. Now uh, I will describe an experiment which is a very is a pioneer experiment in using. It's in, this is a, an experiment, an old experiment from a time that where people could not count so easily on the DMD, DMD spatial light modulators and so on. And to play with the spatial properties of a light beam was a hard task at that time. Okay. So this work, this, this seminal work, uh, which is really a very, very beautiful experiment, was made uh, in a collaboration between the French people at the Colonel Marco and Fabre and, uh, and Hans Bachoff group in, in Australia, okay? And at that time, Ping Kui Lam, who is now a very important person in front information, was a PhD student, and uh, so was Nicola Kneps, uh, who is also a group leader in, in, in Paris, okay? He was a PhD student, Ulrich Anderson. I know that you, you can see here very, some famous names here, okay? And uh, I, I, I'm really sure that this is one of the experiments that contributed to the to the, to, to the success of the of the people. Okay, it's a really very a very important experiment. And actually, the idea was the following. Okay, so suppose you are going to detect you want, you 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 want to detect small shifts, small fluctuations. Transverse fluctuations of an optical beam, okay? Just like Shai and Kimei detect the, the position of the trapped particle, okay? With a, with a quadrant detector, okay? With a quadrant detector. So this is just a, a sector, uh, just a, a, a half, half detector, okay? So it's just not a quadrant, but just uh, two halves, okay? And then uh, the idea is that, okay, I send a beam uh, over the detector, and uh, uh, the, the difference between the two halves of the detector will give me a signal that is proportional to the beam misalignment. Okay, to the beam misalignment. Uh, so if we compute what, we, what the detector is seeing, we calculate what the detector is seeing, actually we have the whole beam. So part, one part of the detector, see the, this is the lower, the response of the lower half, this is the response of the upper half. The total intensity is just the sum. Okay, so, and the difference is this one. Okay, the difference is this one. Now, the first, the first part of the experiment, the first part of the whole idea here is very subtle. So you, are, you want to, to measure what you are sending to the detector is a TM00 Gaussian beam. Okay, the best one that you can get from a laser. Okay, and then what he they they, uh, they found out was something very subtle. You let's let's think about a basis of the spatial modes or transverse modes, but instead of uh, building this basis in the usual way with the mid Gaussian modes or a gang Gaussian modes or whatever. We do the following. The first member of the basis is our beam, our sample beam, TM00. The second member of the basis will be what they call the flipped mode. The flipped, flipped mode is this kind of beam. It's just, it's identical to the Gaussian, but now suppose that the first half of the Gaussian here will invert its phase. So it's just make a, a, an operation, uh, what can I say, a reflection operation, a particle operation in the first half of the beam here. And then you have the flipped mode, flipped mode. It's not continuous, it's very weird, mathematically very weird, okay? 
But then those two are clearly orthogonal. So the first we have the first member of the, uh, of the node space, the second member, which is orthogonal to the one. And then suppose you keep building this space however you want. In some U2, node U2 that is orthogonal to zero and one, three that is orthogonal to the other ones. You keep on moving and define it if you want. The point that they found out is actually to describe, to fully describe this kind of measurement with this full detector, you only need the first two points. So all, uh, uh, all properties of this measurement, fluctuations, mean values, everything are captured only by this first two points. All the rest does not matter. Okay? And uh, what they, this is a calculation that justifies this, okay? You take, for example, suppose that you, you, you take, for example, the, the cross term that you get, because as I said, if you, I, I told you in the first talk that if we somehow clip or interrupt, uh, block partially the beam that you are detecting, what happens is that in the detection, you will have cross terms between different modes of the of the beam, different transverse modes of the beam. Okay? So if you have a beam that has some, suppose, TM00 Gaussian model and some Laguerre Gaussian component also, okay, if you detect, all you will see is the added power of the Gaussian and the Laguerre Gaussian model. Okay, if they have two problems. But if you block part of the beam, then no, it's no longer true. Okay, you start to see, because when you integrate all over the detector, if the detector is uh, virtually infinite, the orthogonality of the of the two modes, Gaussian and again Gaussian, will guarantee that you don't see the cross terms. But if you block the beam, then the cross terms will appear. Okay, they will appear. And, and the, what happens is that actually when you compute the cross terms between any mode, any mode with a zero mode, which is your, your original beam, okay? You can put this, uh, this kind of uh, cross term here as, a, a, how can I say, as an overlap with the first mode, with the, with the clipped mode. Because this minus sign here is exactly, uh, by, by the way, I should have done the contrary, the contrary which, to, to match the figure, okay? The, I should have the minus here and the plus here. It's just a detail, okay? So uh, uh, this minus sign exactly reproduces the clip that you have here. So what is happening here is that actually when you calculate the cross term of any other higher order mode, with the with your sample mode is exactly the uh, equal to the overlap between these modes and the clipped mode. Of course, for the clip, clipped mode itself, it's one. But for all the other modes, by definition, they are orthogonal to the first two, so it's a zero. This means that with this clipped, the definition of this clipped mode, only those two modes will capture the whole property of the detected signal. And it's a key, it's a key uh, ingredient of the experiment. So actually, now what, what I show here is essentially the following. Suppose you have a beam that is a, a coherent state, okay, for zero, for, for the mode zero, then you have a coherent state at TM zero zero. And you have some state that you don't know at the flipped mode. And all the rest is uh, that is not populated with points. Okay. Uh, now, for to, to compact the notation, I will, I will I will no longer mention modes that are not occupied. Okay. I will only show uh, the uh, the state of the modes that are occupied somehow. Now, if I uh, I will calculate this part here, the, the, this intensity distribution in this state, I have the cross terms here. I have the, 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 the addition of the two intensities of the two modes, okay, the, the, the clipped in the original mode, and I have the cross terms here. 
Okay. When I make the difference, what happens between the two halves of the beam? If you look at this in this triplet mode, but its model is square, is it the identical to the Gaussian? And when you make the difference, this part here cancels out. And you see only this part. This is the part that you see. So actually, the difference that you make is this look. Actually, what you are seeing in, uh, in this scenario in which you have the, a Gaussian mode being detected, okay, with a split detector, is actually you can see that the Gaussian mode is uh, homodyne, is being homodyne, homodyne with the flipped mode. And you, what the noise that you see is <coughs> proportional to the quadrature noise of the flipped mode. So you can see that the quadrature noise of the flipped mode will be responsible for the fluctuations on your on your, on your beam, okay? If this guy is squeezed, if this guy is squeezed, then you would have sub-short noise, sub-short noise uh, signal, okay, in the, in the So to have this kind of uh, precision measurement, I would need to produce a squeezed flipped mode. What the hell? This is a, you see, the mode is not continuous. Now imagine that you are going to build an OPO and try to squeeze this. But then comes the interesting, it's not, of course, it's not what Maria is going to do, okay? By the way, neither they did it, okay? What they did was completely different. Okay, can you know about one second? Yeah, yeah, sure. So where is here the displaced bit? The displaced bit. The displaced bit is actually the sum of the, the Gaussian with the flipped mode. The actually you can you can you can. So it's not that alpha zero. Super. I'm sorry. So it's not that alpha zero. No, it's not that alpha zero. The, this is the displaced bit. This is the displaced bit. This is just a part of it. Okay. Uh, so I cannot see the. the so you say. Uh, Alpha zero? The beam is this one. Uh, actually, the state of the displaced beam is this one. Okay? Suppose you have um, a beam, which is a Gaussian, that is not perfectly centered uh, at the detector, it's epsilon above. Mm -hmm. You can write as a sum of a, ga a centered Gaussian, and then you can use the flipped mode to the next uh, term, and all the rest, but the second, but the flipped mode is going to be a coherent state. So. In this case, yes, I, I I left here, I left here an arbitrary state. If it's if it's a coherent state, which is just a beam that was a bit mm -hmm. displaced, then what you get here is just short noise, short noise. Okay. And the statement uh, is given by the relation between alpha and the beam. Uh, the displacement, well, okay, uh, 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 the displacement, what, what happens is this. If you have a displacement, beam, only this, okay, just a displacement, what you have here is some alpha, and here you would have also a coherent state with some beta, it's, but with a different coefficient. And this coefficient beta here should be small, a small one, okay? That uh, should be a small one. Um, if your displacement is very small, okay. First thing. Also, later I can anticipate uh, some stuff. Also, this beta should be have the same phase as alpha. If it's if it's just, how can I say, a parallel displacement, and it could have some relative phase with respect to alpha. If this is just I mean, the a small okay, because then you would be cutting at you see, you have a Gaussian beam that's like this, but you are cutting like this, so you have phase variation. Okay, but the flipped mode in this case would have some 
So you can you can account for both with this model. You can account displacement and misalignment. Right? So uh, it's a really very interesting. And then uh, and then uh, what you see is essentially you are seeing okay what I detect with this flipped uh, detector is actually the homodyning between the center Gaussian mode and the flipped mode of that detector. And again, it's very important that the modes that we are defining here are modes uh, adapted to a given detector. Okay. So uh, now they didn't want, of course, they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to squeeze the flipped mode. So what did they do? They did the opposite. They, they some, in some sense, in some sense, what happens is that you can think that the, the, the flipped mode is the mode of the detector. The detector, when you make this intensity difference, is like as you were making a projection back to the flipped mode. So what did they, they do? Instead of uh, uh, of squeezing a flipped mode, they use a squeeze uh, a flipped local oscillator. So then there would be two flips, one made by the local oscillator and a one made by the the detector. So the two flips would compensate. Actually, with the flip uh, doing the, this differential measurement with the flipped local oscillator. What you see is the noise in your Gaussian beam. So they build an OPO to produce a Gaussian beam, a squeezed Gaussian beam, det and detected with this, uh, this uh, split detector and a uh, flipped mode, local split. And this allowed them to see, for example, subshock noise, squeezed, uh, because here, oh, here, you see, here is a quadrature of the Gaussian mode, and this is the squeezed state. I'm assuming here that you have a squeezed state here that is produced physically by the field. Okay? So this is how the experiment was, okay? At that time, again, there was no NKT laser with, uh, with pump, and uh, and uh, with, the, with the second harmonic and the original frequency, so they had to build a second harmonic generation gravity, and then use it as a pump, okay, for the OPO, pump the OPO. and also there was uh, uh, the, the, the 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 pump op the pump OPO was uh, the, the OPO was pumped by the second harmonic from an original laser here. So there was a, a phase relationship between the second harmonic and this laser. And then the, the, the original laser was sent uh, to the, uh, was split part of it was going to the OPA or to the OPO cavity, but actually it's, it's a seeded OPO, so it was amplified here, okay? Small amount amplified here, and the other part was sent to uh, the homodynamic detection. Okay, and this was then the, the OPO, the OPA out of here. Okay, so when uh, when when it's being operated through low pressure, people use this jargon of OPA. We call it an amplifier, not an oscillator. Okay, there is a jargon. So sometimes you will see the word oscillator, sometimes amplifier. Rigorously speaking, an amplifier is when it's below pressure, an oscillator. But now I think that people has become uh, has become uh, a bit, uh, you can say, sloppy with this uh, jargon. You see OPO all the time, okay? But at that time, especially the, those people, they were very strict about it. So they were like uh, seeding a bit the amplifier, and then you have this uh, being used as a local as a local oscillator. Here you have the squeeze mode at the TM00, the squeeze state at the TM00 mode. And then what how did they do the the the, the flipped mode? What they did was to order a half wave plate, okay, they order a half wave plate in which 
the fast and slow axis of one half was rotated by 90 degrees with, with respect to the fast and slow axis of the other. Okay. And then, since the phase difference in a half wave plate between the two uh, polarization is pi, okay, then a Gaussian beam horizontally polarized impinging in this uh, wave plate would acquire different phases in the two halves. Okay, they, so first they try they, they try to to glue two uh, wave plates, but of course they, they didn't they didn't work. And then the order, the order was very expensive at the time because it was designed under the time, okay, but uh, it was very well. So these are the results, okay? So in this case here, what you see is the shot noise of each half of the detector. So they would detect here. So they would, they had access to both turrets, photocons from each half of this two detector, okay? And then this is the shot noise of each half, okay? This is the noise of the of the sum of the two photocurrents, okay? And this is the difference, the noise of the difference. Okay. So you see that it's below, below the sum and below the short noise. Okay. And this is the demonstration that what they did was to, for example, they 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 use the, so you see that this uh, electro optic modulator here is a bit a bit tilted, okay? And the reason is that they are actually going to, they use it to produce an artificial noise, an artificial fluctuation of the, of the beam direction, okay? And uh, they measured this uh, uh, in frequency domain. Uh, first, sending a coherent state. So you see that the, the, the what can I say, the frequency, the modulation frequency uh, signal is mounted on a background of something like uh, minus 74.5 dBm, okay? And then they use the, the squeeze the, the squeeze state with the fluted ball here, and they saw the same signal, but mounted on a lower background, okay? So this is the uh, demonstration of sensitivity gain, okay, by uh, structuring the local oscillator. Okay, now this is a, this is one this is a very very beautiful experiment. Okay, so uh, I'm about to how oh, oh, five minutes. Okay, okay. So this is enough. Okay, so I I think that uh, just to to end up a, a different approach that has not been fully exploited. Okay, is to structure the pump at the OPO, okay? So uh, structure the OPO, uh, do the OPO structure and, and maybe use this, the SLM, all, the, all the, the resources that we have nowadays and they were not available at that time to produce, uh, uh, how can I say, the structure is squeeze out, okay? So this experiment we did a long time ago with the people from Sao Paulo, okay, there was Paulo Sesvag, Marcelo Martinez. So these are the guys who demonstrated the tripartite entanglement of the OPO of its threshold, okay, when they generate. And we demonstrated that the transfer of orbital, of the orbital angular momentum in, in this case, but we, we never, we, we could never like see any squeezing or noise reduction under this kind of structure pump in the OPO. We only we studied the dynamics and, and, and investigated the, the conditions for OEM transfer, okay? Which is a, a, a quite integrated a problem in itself, okay? So these are a, a, some, what can I say, examples, okay, of uh, structure, quantum structure light uh, in the old times, okay? There's this, uh, you probably know, Fernando Valcarcel, there's a people from, uh, from Valencia, okay, they, they they studied, for example, symmetry breaking and the squeezing generation in an OPO, type one OPO, okay. Uh, this was, for example, an experiment done to generate continuous variable entanglement with OAM you know, states, 
uh, usually those, those experiments, okay, uh, uh, they actually they structure the beam outside the cavity, okay, not inside the cavity. So it's a, a bit different of, uh, from what we are trying to do. And uh, this is a, 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 a paper that we did in Brazil about a uh, continuous variable hybrid entanglement. So we, we, we demonstrated that we, when you, for example, uh, operate a type two phase match, then you can have simultaneously uh, entanglement between different modes of polarization and spatial mode uh, with, this, uh, with this device. And this was later demonstrated by an experiment uh, done in China by these people here from Gao Zhang. Okay. So with this, we can arrive at the conclusion. I hope that in these two talks, I could give you some uh, useful information about uh, uh, how to incorporate the ideas of structural light into the quantum optics domain and vice versa, okay? So essentially, in, in the two talks, we talked about field, uh, field quantization, the structured light modes. Uh, I, I mentioned the, 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 the relevance and importance of photon detection uh, as a, an absorption mechanism that gives rise to normal order, okay? And this somehow limits the amount of the, the type of information that you can get from the, from the optical beam. Uh, okay, uh, then we, 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 we define how to uh, characterize quantum fluctuations and correlations in, within the spatial structure. Now, so today we, we we, we talked about the parametric processes as phase sensitive amplifiers and how they can be used to be, this phase sensitive amplifier is used to, to squeeze noise, okay? And uh, I also, uh, we also uh, discussed here uh, an application, an interesting application for metrology problem of uh, detecting light beam displacement. And I think that structured pumps, uh, uh, to, to a structured pump of fuel is an interesting lead for future research in this. Well, with that, I thank you very much <laughs> for your attention and the promise of the future <laughs> of, the, of the parametric facility. <laughs> In the, in the experiment of the inverted uh, mode, uh, why uh, did you decide to make the inversion in the local oscillator? This was uh, much more difficult in the... No, okay. No, no, it's, uh, you see, it's, there, there were two, you see, you want to produce a beam, at the end, you want to produce a beam that has sub-shot noise, uh, uh, what can I say? Displacement uh, uh, fluctuations, okay? Subshot, split displacement fluctuations. So, because of this, this, uh, because of this uh, structure of the fluctuations with the main mode and the, in this, uh, the flipped mode, you have two options to do that. You can have, for example, you can squeeze this mode. If you squeeze this mode, then you will have some squeezing in the displacement, okay? But this is difficult. But the mode itself is already difficult to generate. Now, imagine to build an amplifier that amplifies this kind of mode and squeezes its, its noise, you know? It's much more difficult. Now, usually the amplifiers are, they, are, they consist of cavities that are designed to operate with Gaussian mix, okay? So then the, uh, they saw that actually they didn't need to squeeze that one. If they, if they uh, uh, instead, if they squeezed the Gaussian mode and combined the Gaussian mode with the flipped mode in a local oscillator, the resulting beam here, so this is the final beam that we are going to measure. The resulting beam has a squeezed displacement oscillation. Okay. It was much easier. Okay, you have one time, so you do this. The solution of the, the, the 
a crystal in the cavity that, that you want to operate below threshold to have the twist. So uh, the limit of the amount of power that you can get out of the squeeze state is the, yeah. the threshold that you get times the efficiency of the gun conversion process. Times the frequency. No, uh, the, the efficiency of the gun conversion process. Okay. I, I mean, the threshold yeah. times the, I am the probability yes. of get. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, essentially the power that you get in the squeeze light is the product of the pump uh, times the efficiency of the process. Yes, it's true. Uh, actually, in, in general, when you do the theory, you see that close to the threshold, you, the theory predicts that close to the threshold, you should get maximum squeeze. But this is the theory, okay? Usually when you get close to the threshold, all noises are amplified. You know, the, the, the theory gives this maximum squeezing because the, when you get to the threshold, one of the quadratures, get, uh, the, the fluctuation in one of the quadratures tends to infinity, and the other one tends to maximum squeezing. But you are just getting outside the limit of linearization. You know? So all these squeezing calculations are made assuming a linearized response of the, of the device. But when you get close to the impression, you are no longer there. There is no longer time. Okay, we have Antonio at our disposal for the next couple of days. Let's see when I all the questions that we have. So, thank you, Antonio, for following the nice and thank you. So, I, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you too for the invitation and for the wonderful time that I've been having here and uh, sharing ideas, sharing conversation. Sharing years also. <laughs> <and see that. laughs> okay. Thank You're very you welcome to repeat every year. So, great experience. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. So if we would uh, report. Yeah. Okay, great. Nice, thanks a lot. How, how do you choose the the Ah, you this we discussed 